Good morning and welcome to Christopher McDowell speaking about new developments in early bets medals. Uh, Chris, you can now unmute yourself, turn on your video and start setting up your screen share. There we go. So um, Chris is the editor of the Journal of Early, or Early American Numismatics, got it, um, and has done a lot of work I know with Colonial Coins as well. I know he's involved in C4, um, the Colonial Coin Collectors Club, if not, you all don't know what C4 stands for. Um, so today we'll be talking about metals as opposed to Colonial Coins, um, but I'm sure we have some interesting new information on those as well. Okay, just let me know if you need anything else. I will be watching. I'm going to disappear into the background. Thank you, Leanna. Thank you, everyone. Uh, first, in order to understand Betts Metals, we have to take a step back and talk about who is, uh, who is Betts. Uh, C. Willis Betts uh, was born in New York and moved to New Haven as a young man. While he was there, he became very sick. Uh, and his physician ordered him to go outside, enjoy the outdoors, which he did. And during that period of time, he began to collect coins and medals and, and amassed a, a very large collection as a, uh, as a young man. He entered Yale College and he did not fight in the Civil War. As you can see there, he died when he was 41 years old. Uh, he wrote several books on coins and metals uh, or articles, the most famous of which, and the one we're here about, is uh, the American Colonial History Illustrated by Contemporary Metals. Uh, this book was actually finished after his death. Uh, he, he died in, uh, as you can see before, in 1887. The book was published posthumously in 1894. Uh, the, this is the paramount book for coins and American coins in the collection of American metals, I should say. Um, it's divided. We're going to talk about the first two chapters of the book, uh, the, the first of which deals uh, with the discovery period, the discovery of the new world. Uh, th there's been no books, there's been no updates on bets. Uh, these first two chapters since this book was written, uh, there's uh, lots of new discoveries, there's lots of new information. I'm gonna try to hit some of the highlights uh, and we're gonna cover sort of the, the scope of the history of Betts Metals. Well, of course it starts with the discovery period with the discovery of the new world in 1492 by Col Christopher Columbus. One of the first things that you gather when you go through Betts Metals is that we view today the discovery of the New World uh, as something akin to the moon landing. That is, it, it was a phenomenal event at the time that it occurred. Uh, but the reality of it is the discovery of the new world is more like the discovery of the internet, the invention of the internet, uh, in that it was something that kind of crept up on people. The event when it occurred was not a big deal. It was not sort of headlines, uh, and it was not con uh, commemorated in medals. Uh, and so it was more like, uh, say, the internet, that you woke up 10, 15 years after the internet was created and you realized that it had really changed the world. It had changed people's lives, but at the moment, it was not a big deal. Uh, therefore, Betts number one, that is the first Betts medal, uh, and we call them Betts medals because these are the, the medals that are in C. Willis Betts' book. The first one, uh, as you can see, is 1556. So if you think that Christopher Columbus discovered the new world in 1492, it's not until 1556 that the new world begins to even be noticed. And it's noticed because it becomes more of an economic powerhouse for the Spanish. For generations, the Spanish uh, had the new world as their own domain. And during that period, they began to exploit the new world, but it was not until many decades after Christopher Columbus's discovery that the riches of the new world 
began to make a difference in the lives of the people of Spain, similar again to the internet. It's not until many years after the internet's created that it starts to have this impact on our life. So when you look at Betts medals, when we look at Betts number one, uh, this is sort of the setup uh, as it is in his book. Each one of the, the medals in the book uh, has a simple write-up like this. Now, the book is titled that it's an illustration, uh, illustrated or colonial history illustrated by medals, but the reality of it is Betts has very few illustrations of the medals, particularly in the first two chapters of his book. And that's probably because he himself did not have some of these medals. So this first medal is the king of the new world. And as you see, when you, you look at this, the bottom, his source is, uh, the, is VL18. So that stands for uh, Van Loon. Van Loon was an attorney in Holland, and he wrote a four volume book uh, that is published initially in Dutch and then later in French. Uh, and it is really the inspiration uh, and the place where Betts got most of his information for these early medals in the book. Uh, Van Loon's book is, is a, just a phenomenal work. And so what Betts did is he went through Van Loon's book and he pulled out those medals that he felt dealt with the discovery period, the early discovery of the new world. So Betts one is this medal, uh, which of course, as I indicated, is not illustrated in Betts. So this uh, has Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor on one side and Philip II, his son on the other side. The sole reason why this is Betts one is because the medal on the side for Philip II says Novi Orbis, the, the, the new world. And it declares Philip II, king of the new world. So these first group of medals really doesn't have much to do with the discovery of the new world, but they are medals that mention, they simply mention the new world and call Philip II, the ruler, the king, uh, of the new world. And so as you look at these medals, you know, you, you have to really question really why they were even included in the book. Uh, Bet's book uh, was completed by a group of editors that included his brother, Lyman Lowe, uh, and another numismatist from Boston, uh, Marvin. And sometimes you have to question too, who, who put these medals in the book? Was it Betts initially or was it his editors? This one and these early Nova Orbis were actually included by Betts initially. The first real, the first medal that really mentions the new world and the discovery, this is the discovery period in chapter one, the discovery of the new world is Betts 12. Uh, and, and as again, you can see that Betts gets his information from Van Loon, volume one, page 283. Betts cites the French version of Van Loon uh, rather than the Dutch version. So if you have a version and it's not on that page, you probably have the Dutch version rather than the French version of the book. So this is, there's a couple of things in Betts' description of this Betts 12. Uh, first, he says that, it's, uh, that it has a, uh, a camel on it uh, and that the animal he describes as a camel. When we look at the, the metal, you see the animal there and you see the people. And Betts also dates this metal to 1581. The metal was made by uh, an Italian named uh, Pagoni, Pugini, uh, who worked with the Spanish court. Philip II was born in the lowlands uh, to the Holy Roman Emperor, but when he became King of Spain, he moved his court to Madrid. And this begins sort of a rift between the lowlands, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Spain as the court moves to Madrid. A lot of the questions with respect to Betts 12 uh, have been now answered. Uh, the, the medal was not made in 1581, as Betts uh, believed, but rather made in 1561. 
We know this because uh, Pagini wrote a letter back to his former uh, boss in the Medici family in Italy, in which he described the medal uh, to them. So he says that the, the reverse, and you can see that, that he went to great pains to make sure that this medal was accurate in its description of the new world. And that the, he dressed up women and people in the garb uh, of uh, the people from Peru, the, from the new world, and that there was actually uh, an animal, a llama, uh, in uh, sort of a zoo-like environment in Madrid that had been brought back from the new world. So the animal is not a camel, as Betts believed, but rather uh, a llama, uh, an actual, based on an actual llama. And this is how Pagini uh, describes this metal. So this is, this is the first real metal in 1562 uh, that really gets into the new world, that describes the new world accurately. It, it describes the animals, it describes the people of the new world, uh, but it also makes very clear when you look at the metal that the Spanish are in control of the new world. The people on that metal are paying homage to, the Spain, to, to Spain. The camel is carrying uh, silver, uh, the people are giving goods to the Spanish. So this is really about Spanish trade. As you look at these early Betts medals, what uh, is occurring here is, is a fight between the Dutch and the Spanish for control of the New World. As the, uh, the Spanish court uh, took over, the lowlands, those people began to resent uh, the control and the taxes that Spain imposed upon them, and, and you have the Spanish revolt. Uh, and eventually, the, the, sorry, the, the, the revolt of the Dutch, the Dutch Revolution, uh, the, this becomes a religious conflict between Spain, Catholic Spain, and Protestant Holland. At first, it's, it's more of an issue of taxation and control, uh, but it becomes a very bitter feud. Uh, and this feud spills over into the New World and into the Discovery era. These early Betts medals are, are talking about really the struggle for control over the New World. Eventually, in about 1599, the, the Dutch develop a very strong navy and they decide to take the fight directly to the Spanish for the New World. And Betts number 19 is a medal that Betts at least believed uh, discovered or, or talked about the New World. This is the 1599 Dutch Expeditionary Medal. That's the way I describe it. Uh, Betts believed that this medal uh, discussed the capture of St. Thomas. Betts believed that this was St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands, and he describes it as such. Here's the medal. It's a, it's a rather beautiful medal for the period, uh, and really, it has nothing to do with the New World. This is, uh, but rather, it does deal with the, the struggle over control of the New World, uh, but the, the Spanish um, had controlled the, car, uh, the islands uh, off their coast, of course, and most of the New World. The Dutch take an expedition, which is an effort to try to capture the Silver Fleet, but the island that they capture, while it is St. Thomas, was Sao Tome, St. Thomas, which was then called St. Thomas, uh, off of Africa. Uh, so Betts had the wrong St. Thomas. It's not was not St. Thomas uh, in the Americas, but rather St. Thomas off the coast of Africa. And as you go through these early medals, you see that Betts makes many errors like this, some large, some small, um, with, his, with, his, with his history. Uh, but overall, he, he gets the story of the struggle correct. Sort of hitting the highlights and some of the, the major themes of the, uh, of the early Betts book. The next major theme in the book, uh, the one that plays out over the course of the next 200 years, is the effort of virtually every nation in Europe to try to capture the Spanish silver fleet. 
Uh, every year, the, Spain, the Spanish would sail a fleet from the New World to um, Cardiz near Seville, Spain, uh, laden with silver and gold and, and other merchandise. And all the other nations of Europe understood that if they could capture that fleet, not only would they weaken the Spanish, uh, but they would enrich themselves. The first man to do this, to actually get the fleet, uh, was Pete Hine. And this is a, a story that is not told in our history books today. And one of the great things as you go through the Betts medals is that these are contemporary history. This is what the people who lived at the time, what they thought was important. And it's not necessarily the history that we today in America think is important, but it's what was a great event to them. This capture of the Spanish fleet by Pete Hine in 1629 was a huge event for the people of Holland at the time. So Pete set out to capture the fleet and the Spanish heard news uh, that he was there. So they were able to stop half the fleet, but the fleet, the part of the, the fleet from Veracruz had sailed and it was in Havana and Pete Hine and his fleet lay outside Havana to try to capture the silver fleet. Eventually they corner the, the Spanish silver fleet in a, a bay uh, close to Havana, a little east of Havana, and they capture the entire Spanish fleet uh, without basically losing a man or ship. Uh, and they took this, this silver, which included 177 pounds of silver, 68 pounds of gold, back to Holland. And when they did that, of course, Pete Hine was a national hero. Many of these medals were actually made from the silver that came from the silver fleet. And they are a beautiful group of medals. I'm just showing a couple of them, uh, but the, uh, the Dutch made, it's probably about seven different medals to commemorate the capture of the Spanish fleet. Pete Hine becomes a national hero, but he dies that same year. They make him admiral of the entire Dutch fleet and send him off on a mission to capture Dunkirk, uh, which was a heavily defended city. Uh, and in the effort, uh, he was killed. And this is commemorated as well on a medal. The general history of this discovery period uh, between the Dutch and the Spanish, and one of the beauties of the Betts medals as you go through this chapter, is you see how history plays out. Uh, and as a general principle, the, the Dutch just take it to the Spanish. Uh, almost all these battles are Dutch victories, uh, but there is one at least one major one here, uh, and it's a single battle uh, that is a Spanish victory. And so I'll pull it out uh, to, to show you this medal here. And it commemorates the Battle of 1631 uh, off Brazil. The Spanish had colonized Brazil and they had large sugar fields there. And they brought the sugar, which was extremely valuable uh, back to Europe. Well, the Dutch, who had spies everywhere, knew when the fleet was going to be sailing. So this is not a silver fleet, but a sugar fleet. And they decided that they were going to intercept it. The two commanders in this battle were two captains who had committed to fight to the death. And as the sugar fleet uh, is making its way across the Atlantic, it's intercepted by the Dutch. And the two captains, the two fleets, each carrying about 22 ships, the two captains lash their ships together and they fight for six hours uh, back and forth uh, in a vicious battle. Eventually, the Dutch ship catches on fire. The Dutch captain is asked to surrender his ship. Instead of doing so, he wraps himself in the, the flag of his nation and he jumps overboard. The uh, battle, the, the wounded sugar fleet then makes its way back to Spain and they make this medal 
here, and it shows Philip, the king of Spain, uh, on the obverse and on the reverse. It is uh, Samson, it's, a, it's from the Bible, uh, who is uh, renting a lion. And the lion, uh, as you see, stands for the Dutch, the Dutch lion. And so this is the Spanish killing the Dutch lion. In the biblical story, Samson kills the lion. He goes back the next day, and there's a, a pot of honey there from bees who have uh, uh, taken the place of the lion. And so this is a symbolism of the, uh, the sugar uh, that, that remains. So this is, it's, it's a rather lovely uh, metal, but it's one of the few in which the Spanish sort of best the Dutch. The metal uh, is from a, the image on the reverse is from a painting from Paul Rubens. And as you can see, it's a pretty good copy of that painting. But overall in this history of the discovery of the world, of the new world, uh, as I indicated, the, the Dutch get the best of the Spanish. And so here we see the lion who was being killed before by the Spanish. Now this is the Dutch lion and he is taking down the pillars of Hercules. Uh, the, the new world is now controlled by, this, by the Dutch or the Dutch feel that they have bested overall. And this is the last medal in the chapter on the period of discovery. And so here we see that the, the Dutch feel themselves the ultimate victors in this war uh, between themselves and the Spanish. And the Dutch do receive their freedom from and their independence from Spain. And so not only did they win the battle on the sea, but they also won the battle for their independence. What does this have to do with America? Not a whole lot, uh, but it does have something to do with this period of discovery. The first chapter of the book is mostly Spain and Holland. There are interspersed some medals, uh, Sir Francis Drake's Circumnavigation of the World, uh, but, uh, which is an English medal. But for the most part, these medals are Dutch and Spanish medals. Chapter two of Bet's book deals with the period of colonization. And so now the period of discovery, discovery of the new world is over. And so they are now going to colonize the new world. And so we start with the first three medals in chapter two are these uh, Maryland medals which are lovely metals, which have a great deal to do with America. This is uh, Lord and Lady Baltimore. Uh, this is the colonization, deals with the colonization uh, of America and Maryland. This is a, the next medal, and this is probably uh, one of the more interesting early Betts medals. There's, a, uh, uh, there's Lord Baltimore on the obverse, on the reverse is a, a map of Maryland. But what I want to talk about is we, we start to get in chapter two with the colonization period, new players. And they include the French and obviously the English that we just covered some of these Maryland medals. So let's talk about these French medals that are in Betts's book because this is something that is very confusing. Uh, these French medals uh, are all listed as contemporary medals. The first French medal is a 60, 1664 dated medal, which talks about the Company of the West Indies. Uh, as you, you look at these medals, these French medals, one of the things that you need to understand is that Louis the 14th made these medals not necessarily contemporary to events. In fact, very few of the medals listed in Betts books uh, as these French medals were contemporary to the events that they describe. 
rather Louis the 14th saw the propaganda value of metals. And so he ordered a committee to start to make metals that went over the course of his reign. Uh, so they were made uh, often around uh, 1722 uh, or before. And they are not contemporary with the events, although that metals may be dated an earlier date, they are not contemporary uh, with the events that they describe. Rather, they are a propaganda effort by Louis XIV. Along with these medals, he published a beautiful book. Uh, this is uh, part of the book uh, to describe his medals. So when people would come to Versailles, he would give them all these medals that described the glories of his reign so they could take them back. Uh, but again, they're not necessarily contemporaneous, but they do describe events that occurred during the period. So let's, we'll just take one of these medals, uh, for example. So this is what Louis XIV would have you believe was the victory at uh, Tobago, uh, which is in the Caribbean. A lot of the Betts medals that are the French Betts, Betts medals are describing the islands of the, the Caribbean. The islands of the Caribbean produce more wealth, more value for the European nations than, than do North America. One island, one sugar producing island in the Caribbean uh, would be worth all of the 13 American colonies. And so these islands were very valuable. In 16, 77, the French are committed to take the island of Tobago from the Dutch, who of course had taken it from the Spanish. And there were three battles. The first one occurred in early 1677, in which the French attack the island, but are repulsed uh, by the Dutch defenders. And then the second battle, which is what this medal commemorates, which was on March 3rd, 1677. And on this battle, the, the French attack the island, uh, but again, are unable to take the Dutch fort. Uh, there is a large Dutch, or there was a large Dutch fleet uh, in the harbor, and the French decide they're gonna sink that fleet. As they enter the harbor, the harbor was very narrow, one of the Dutch ships caught on fire and it exploded. Uh, and when it exploded, it caught several other of the ships uh, in the bay on fire as well, a great loss of life uh, to the Dutch and to the French who were in the bay, in the narrow bay as well, uh, including one transport that carried all the women and children uh, and the slaves that the Dutch had. So all, their, all the women and children on the island died, all the slaves died, leaving the fort just commanded by the Dutch men, uh, who now had every, had nothing to live for. And they again repulsed the, the French. The French then go back to Paris and they tell Louis XIV uh, that they have destroyed the Dutch fleet. Uh, and so Louis XIV commemorates this medal. And this is the medal Bets 52 uh, that's listed in Bets. These are the 41 millimeter medals are the ones that Bets picks out. This medal shows on the on the obverse Louis the 14th. He's the most Christian king. That's you know um, that's why you always see that uh, as his title. On the reverse. It shows the uh, incendiary, the, the victory. She's carrying a flame in her right hand as she destroys the Dutch fleet. This medal, this is Betts 53, the 70 millimeter medal is, is a contemporary medal uh, of the time. The 41 millimeter medals that Betts lists in every instance uh, were not contemporary, but later, but this uh, was actually made uh, into a contemporary medal. 
And there were many of these medals. So for almost all these French medals, these French victories, there's not just one medal, but there might be six uh, or more French medals commemorating the same event. If you remember earlier, I was showing you that book, that folio book that Louis XIV had made. Betts looked at that book and Betts believed that every medal depicted in that book was an actual medal and that it looked just like what he saw uh, in, that, in that book. And Betts 55 uh, is again a 41 millimeter medal, uh, but this is an image from the actual book uh, and the medal that Betts described, but this medal does not exist at least as Betts describes it. Betts makes this error again and again uh, for all of these 41 millimeter medals. And, and some of them he'll describe a medal that actually exists that he maybe had in his collection, but then he falls back and he also describes the medals that appeared in the book that don't exist. Again, for reasons that I can't explain, the, the French really felt that this battle, second battle of Tobago was a huge victory for them, even though they had set out to take the island and they failed to take the island. Uh, but Betts also describes not just medals, uh, but also jetons. Uh, and so Betts' book is not just contemporary medals, but in many instances, what he is describing is a jeton rather than a medal. So Betts 57, describing the same event, is not a medal but a jeton. And I'll pull this French medal out and describe it for you because it's basically the way every one of these 41 millimeter French medals go. You have an actual 41 millimeter medal, you have potentially a contemporary, uh, true contemporary medal, uh, then you have Betts believing that the book uh, described an actual medal, but it didn't, it doesn't exist. And then you maybe have a jeton or other medals or restrikes. Many of these French medals were restruck at the Paris Mint. One of the ways that you can tell a restrike from the original is that generally the original medals have a beveled edge. Uh, they do and then the restrike, later restrikes, will have a mint mark uh, from the Paris Mint, and they'll also have the, um, the name of the metal, either, that is, it'll either be copper, when I say name, the, the, the metal, M-E-T metal uh, of the metal uh, on the edge as well. We're now up to bet 62, and I, and I pull this out uh, because this, again, is the, the age of colonization. And Betts viewed the colonization period uh, differently than did many other period, people of the time. Uh, he had a very forward-looking, even though he died at the age of 41, uh, he had a very forward-looking, he was a very well-educated man, and he understood that the colonization was not just military victories, um, but there was another aspect to it. And this, this next portion uh, of his book is the Religious Medals for the Indians. Uh, and this medal number 62 is a medal that has never been sold before, never been seen before, uh, and I'm about to show it to you. Uh, this is um, a medal that when Betts died, all of his medals were given to his alma mater at Yale. And so what I've been able to do is go through all of those medals and match them against the descriptions in his book. Uh, and this Betts 62 is a medal that was very heavily criticized by uh, the editors of the book. They did not want to remove the medal uh, from the book uh, but they felt that it was uh, a religious medal, a devotional medal, uh, that it was uh, a Catholic medal, uh, but that it was not a medal that should be included in the book. But nonetheless, they left it in there. It's not illustrated uh, in Bet's book. 
here it is. And so this is the medal that matches the description in Betts' book. It's Betts 62. Uh, it's in Yale's, uh, the Yale Art Gallery. Uh, and I'm going to take a minute to describe what this medal is. Uh, and I'm going to go against the editors, and I'm in Bet's camp on this. Uh, the colonization of the New World is not just uh, the, the destruction of the native people, the, the economic aspects, but also there was a transfer of the religions. Uh, that is, the, the native people took on the Spanish religion, Catholicism, and this medal discusses that. Uh, it commemorates an event that occurred in 1531 uh, where a, a peasant man, Juan Diego, sees the image of Mary uh, on a hill outside Mexico City and Mary tells him to build a shrine to her there. And the peasant goes to the archbishop and tells him that he's seen the Virgin Mary uh, and he's Put off. They don't believe him. They say, well, go get proof. So he goes back to the hill, and again he sees Mary, and she tells him to gather some roses, which he does, and he puts them uh, into his cloak. He goes back to the archbishop uh, and lays out the, uh, the roses, and there on his peasant garb uh, is this image of, of Mary. And then the, uh, a large church is built on this site, which still stands today. It's a, a, a large shrine. Uh, this is the actual uh, photograph of the, uh, the peasant's garb with the image of Mary, it's similar to uh, the image of Jesus uh, on the um, Shroud of Turin, uh, but a little different. And so what Betts is, is realizing here with this metal, it's really, it's the exchange between the new and the old world. Uh, and this is the exchange of religions between the old and the new world. This is the, the indigenous people of the new world taking on Catholicism. This particular metal is dated, like, uh, it's dated 15, sorry, uh, 1682. The story behind that medal is that when they went to renovate the church on the site in 1682, uh, some of these medals were made in the Vatican. They were shipped to Mexico and they were sold or given to big donors for uh, the reconstruction of the church that's going to house uh, this image of, of Mary. And so this is truly uh, a medal that is you know, was distributed in the New World uh, and commemorates a New World event. Uh, it's much more of a medal that talks about colonization than are many of the other medals uh, that quite frankly are listed in Bett's book. The story of colonization, as I indicated, is, is mostly a story of the, the French, the English, the Spanish, the Dutch, uh, but for one brief moment, the Scottish got involved in the action, but they came to the game very late. And when, by the time the, the Scots got involved, everything was pretty much taken up. That is all the land had been claimed by one European power uh, or another. Bet's number 88, the Darien Medal, is the only Scottish medal in the first two chapters of Bet's book. It's one of the few Scottish medals uh, in Bet's book at all. And so it commemorates the Scots colonization of the New World, uh, something that probably very few people have heard about. Uh, the Scots looked around the New World and they found one area that had no one had claimed. Well, actually, the Spanish had claimed it, uh, but they had abandoned it. And it was in the peninsula of Panama, uh, this Darien area, which is actually where, where Balboa had crossed the Isthmus of Panama to see the Pacific Ocean for the first time. And the Scots uh, got up the notion that if they colonized this area, then they could transport goods from the Pacific to the Atlantic and then to Europe 
similar to what the Panama Canal became, began, or became. The problem was the, the Scots never really asked themselves why the Spanish might have abandoned this area. And the reason that the Spanish abandoned the area is because it was a very dense jungle full of disease uh, and the Scots put almost all the wealth in their entire nation, their, the entire Scottish treasury into this colonization effort, uh, which was a fantastic failure. Uh, the Scots began to colonize the area. Uh, they had hoped to trade with the other nations in the area, but of course, no one wants a new player uh, in the game here. And so the English really were out to make sure that this failed uh, and it did fail. The English would not trade with them. The Spanish would not trade with them. They were not able to transport any goods from the Pacific to the Atlantic. Uh, eventually the Spanish, even though they had abandoned the area, decided they weren't gonna allow the Scots to colonize it, attack the Scots uh, and uh, kicked them out after a tremendous battle. The medal, however, commemorates the commander of the defense of the, of the Scottish colony uh, who fought very bravely. While other, other men wanted to abandon the colony, he fought and actually defeated a, a, a Spanish army that had come to wipe them out, uh, giving them some respite. Uh, the, the ships that the carried the, the Scots back to Scotland, um, when they arrived, the, the people of Scotland were very angry uh, because this basically crushed their nation. Eventually, it caused such a collapse of the economy of Scotland that the Scots eventually were forced to join with the English uh, and give up their sovereignty and become part of England. And so this is a very big story uh, in European history and probably one that's never told. The next series of medals in this uh, second chapter um, is the series that deals with the Battle of Vigo Bay. Again, as we've, as you 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 follow the the story of the history of Europe and the colonization of America, it is the effort of these European nations to snatch the Silver Fleet, and. At this point in 1702, the English and the Dutch uh, are again at it with the Spanish, uh, but by this point, Spain is so very weak uh, that the, um, the new king of Spain uh, is a Bourbon, Louis the 14th a grandson, uh, and this starts the, the war of Spanish succession. The, the Dutch and the English fleet camps out outside of Spain waiting for the Silver Fleet to arrive. So instead of going to the Caribbean, as did uh, Pete Hine, they decide they're gonna wait and just wait there for the fleet to arrive. Well, the French who are escorting the Silver Fleet now uh, get word, of course, that the, the Dutch and the English are waiting for them. And they said, well, we're just not gonna go there. We're gonna go to another port. And so they go to a different port uh, that's not set up to receive the, the fleet. The, they avoid the English uh, and the Dutch who are waiting to waylay them. And they, instead they go to Vigo Bay, uh, which had very good defenses, uh, but was not set up to receive the silver fleet. As the ships go into Vigo Bay, uh, they are being unloaded and they're being unloaded for almost a month. The, the Spanish put priority to unload the silver first and the other goods second, but the accountants and the government officials who were in Seville had to move to Vigo Bay, which took up some time. The Dutch and the English get word that they've missed the silver fleet and that it's gone to Vigo Bay instead, and they decide, well, we'll just go there and attack them. And so the English and the Dutch fleet arrive all outside Vigo Bay. The, the, there's about seven or eight medals here uh, in Bet's book. I'm just gonna illustrate Bet's 97 um, that, that commemorate this battle. There are medals that are English. Uh, this is 
an English medal that commemorates it. There are also German medals that commemorate this event. Admiral Rook of the English uh, attacks the Spanish and the French fleet in Vigo Bay uh, as the silver is being offloaded. Most of it, uh, of the silver, uh, has been already offloaded. They're able to capture and destroy uh, the, the French fleet that was escorting the Spanish uh, and take some silver, not, not as much as history would let you believe. Uh, they took the silver to the tower mint and that silver was minted into uh, pieces uh, or um, sixpence and other English coinage. And to commemorate that this silver came from Vigo Bay and the Spanish fleet, the coins uh, at the bottom have V-I-G-O, Vigo, uh, on them to state that this is the silver that came from Vigo Bay. This metal uh, is also made into a jeton, uh, English jeton. Uh, here, it's a, it's a rel relatively sort of a low quality piece. Uh, I show this to many of these metals are very expensive, uh, but there are also many metals in this early group uh, that are not all that expensive. Here's a, a listing of, the, of that jeton that I just showed. So if somebody were to want to collect this piece of history, um, you know, it might may, it maybe cost you a couple of hundred dollars. The next series of medals uh, in the book uh, deal with this Agave Americana uh, medals. There are, I think, eight medals that, that commemorate this plant. Uh, these medals are, are all uh, in Yale now. Uh, this Beth personally collected these, uh, but Beth, this shows again that Beth viewed the colonization period uh, as not just military battles and these enormous events, but again he talked about the religious exchange, which was an exchange between Europe and the New World. But this medal commemorates the flow of culture from the new world back to the old world. And it wasn't just a one-way exchange, this Colombian exchange. There was also, you know, the potato uh, is something and tobacco and other products are found in the new world and taken back to the old world and make a, an enormous impact uh, on Europe and European history as well. Uh, the potato is a, is a fantastic example of that. Uh, but Beth's focus is here on this agave plant. And this is a plant that is native uh, to uh, the Caribbean and to the deserts of America and Mexico. And what Betts is showing here uh, is this plant takes Europe by storm uh, in the 16th century. In the 17th century, uh, it, the plant grows uh, sometimes to over 30, 30 feet. Uh, the, uh, initially, the Europeans believe that it only blooms once every 100 years. And so when there's a bloom of this plant, uh, it is an enormous event. And it is commemorated uh, many times uh, on a medal. And so this is a, a, this medal explains or talks about the flow of goods from the new world to the old world. And I think that it's something in this series of medals uh, is very beautiful and they're very well, um, very well done, uh, but they are, are significant in that respect. The final group of Betts medals uh, that we'll talk about in this age of colonization uh, are the John Law medals. There are uh, many John Law medals. They are perhaps the most complicated medals, uh, Betts medals, uh, in the book. Uh, John Law was a Scottish uh, economist uh, who came up with an idea that he felt could save his native Scotland 
um, but it was rejected by Scotland and instead they favored the unification with England. Uh, he killed a man in a duel and uh, he had to flee England. He went to Holland, he became a banker. Uh, eventually he made his way uh, to the court of Louis XIV uh, in which he was trying to explain his economic theory uh, to Louis XIV, but Louis XIV rejected John Law out of hand because he wasn't Catholic. And Louis XIV said he wasn't going to have anything to do with a heretic. After Louis XIV's death, John Law goes back to Paris and at this time finds a more receptive audience to his economic reforms. These medals have a somewhat tenuous connection to America, uh, to the colonization period. But what John Law was able to eventually do was to consolidate all of the profit generating revenue sort of centers of the French economy uh, under one roof, uh, which included the territory of Louisiana. Uh, and so this becomes in the Mississippi. So this becomes the, this called the Mississippi scheme. So he puts all the revenue generating aspects of the, of the floundering French economy uh, under one roof uh, and, he, and he sells stock and shares uh, in his new company, uh, which go through the roof. Uh, and people come from all over Europe to buy these shares in, his, um, in this new company uh, in, uh, from him in Paris. Uh, he's, he makes many people phenomenally rich. Uh, but there are a group of metal makers uh, from mostly Germany uh, who are very skeptical from the outset of John Law and John Law's scheme. And they, they criticize him um, mercilessly uh, in these, uh, these satirical medals. And this medal here, uh, Betts number 118, which is a 1720 John Law medal, uh, is a satirical medal. It shows on the obverse John Law uh, just spraying share, shares of his new company. On the back is a dog, and this is from uh, an Aesop fable where a dog gives up sort of his bone because he sees a reflection of what he believes is a bigger bone in the river, and he drops his real bone in order to snatch at the mirage of a larger fake bone. And so what this, uh, this medal is criticizing are those people who are investing in John Law's scheme uh, as giving up something real, their money, in order to buy something which the maker of this medal thought was fake, shares. This is a, a, a John Law, um, another John Law medal, or considered a John Law medal. Uh, many of these medals, as you actually look at them, have either nothing to do with John Law or, or nothing to do with America. Uh, this medal is beautiful. It's medal, Bet's number 125. It commemorates the Chamber of Justice, uh, which is actually, if you can see the date, 1716, uh, it actually predates John Law. Uh, it, if you were to collect John Law medals, it might be important, but as to the colonization of America, uh, probably not that important. The, uh, it commemorates a organization that was set up to go after the money lenders and the people who had lent money to Louis XIV. And, and they blame these money lenders and these investors for the failure of the French economy, uh, when in reality it's just the profligate spending of Louis XIV that caused the, uh, the system to go into ruin. But again, Number 125, it's included in Bet's book, but probably doesn't have much to do with the colonization of the New World. The last medal that I'm gonna discuss uh, is Bet's 126, and I include this because it's just kind of a very interesting uh, satirical medal. Here you have John Law on the obverse. Uh, he's smoking a pipe, and he's uh, his pipe is being lit by a share, 
And so he inhales the smoke and he excretes coins. Uh, and so it's, it's a satirical metal saying John Law is making money from nothing. Uh, and it's warning people that John Law and his theories are illusory. Uh, John Law does work to colonize the Mississippi area and Louisiana area, uh, but in reality, he can't get the people that he wants to get to go to the New World. And so Louisiana becomes more of a penal colony. They, they empty the prisons uh, and send these people to the New World to colonize the Mississippi and Louisiana uh, area. Um, but it's all part of John Law's scheme. So there is a connection between John Law and the New World. Uh, but that's it. That's the, the, so this, we see the scope of, in these first two chapters of Betts, uh, from the discovery of America, almost the first metal being really five decades after Columbus discovers America, the fight between the Dutch and the Spanish for control over the New World. And then in the second chapter, we see the various nations uh, trying to colonize uh, the New World, uh, this, and including the Scots. And so the beauty of Bet's book is this is a story that's often not told in your history books. These are the events that people at the time felt were the most important. Uh, and it, uh, it, it really unfolds the scope and the breadth of the discovery and the colonization of the New World. And it's a story that is told entirely from contemporary metals. Uh, and Betts did a great job with it. I think that uh, it's, a, it's a phenomenal book, the first two chapters of his book and the medals that he displays and that he chose for the most part, uh, really tell the scope and the story of the discovery and the colonization of America. Uh, with that, Leanna, uh, I could take any questions or uh, uh, go over anything that I, maybe I missed. Okay, we do have a few questions and a little bit of time left, so we'll go ahead and take a look at some of those. Um, let's see, what is the available uh, availability of BETS 12 and the cost? The availability of BETS 12, there was actually one that was sold um, just a couple of months ago at, at a Stacks auction. BETS 12 is not an extraordinarily rare metal. One of the things that you need to look at when you when you get that BETS 12, the cost uh, ranges in four, thirteen. The some of them were sold for six, seven thousand uh, dollars. Other ones have been sold for as low as five hundred and fifty euros in in England. The the thing you need to watch out for, in my opinion, is these are cast uh, and chased metals, and they were copied. So the one that I showed had uh, the Pagani's name underneath the bust. There are copies, although they're contemporary copies of the same metal that do not have the engraver's name under the bust. I believe those copies were made in the lowlands uh, contemporane contemporaneously, but they were not made uh, in Madrid by the original maker. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful what you get, but the, it, they are available. They are, you could probably find one for three, four thousand dollars, if you wait, there's the answer. Okay. Um, what are the mintage numbers like for some of these metals? The the mintage numbers range greatly. The the the, the Vigo Bay metals uh, and some of the Jetons uh, are very plentiful. Um, they are, and that's why I showed those prices where you can get them for a couple of hundred dollars. The earliest Betts metals, the ones from the 16th century, the ones that are Philip II, uh, those are, are much less plentiful. They were all handmade. They're not made you know, on a machine and mass produced in our industrial age. Uh, they, are, they were cast uh, and then each one of them was looked at by the engraver and uh, he, they were chased, which means he got uh, instruments and smoothed it out to make sure that it was it was perfect. So each one of them is, is handmade rather than mass produced. And so those metals, you know, those 
you know, you might be looking at a metal that maybe there's 50 or 60 or even fewer of those early metals. Uh, and the thing for American collectors is there's interest in these metals in Europe and in America. And so there, that's one of the things that also makes them very expensive. But the jetons, particularly the French metals, the French 41 millimeter metals, they are very plentiful. Uh, and you can get uh, many of those 41 millimeter metals for a few hundred dollars. You can get them on eBay um, very inexpensively. But I caution, uh, remember I said that they were made, there were restrikes made in Paris uh, for probably 200 years after they were initially struck. So you have to make sure that you're getting an original contemporary one for the early uh, 18th century rather than a 19th century restrike when you get that metal. Okay, looks like we have one more question currently in the Q&A. Um, for the amounts of silver and gold captured by Hain at Matanzas, was the weight in pounds or tons? The, the, the weight was, um, was it 177 pounds? I think I've converted it. That was pounds. Uh, 177,000 tons would be much more. Uh, so it was 177 pounds of silver, 68 pounds of gold. And in addition, there were pearls, there was silk, uh, there was sugar, there was uh, other items uh, that were captured as well. Okay, I think that wraps us up right on time. Uh, do you have any final thoughts that you would like to share before we wrap it up? Well, I would say in, in, in conclusion, uh, obviously if you're gonna collect Betts medals, you need to get the book. Uh, you can get an original version of the book. Uh, there are several hundred dollars. Uh, but the, there are many copies that you can get for $20 or $30. You can get it off eBay, uh, and uh, you can start collecting right away. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, Chris. It's been an excellent presentation. And thank you for everyone who listened. Uh, the next presentation starting up is David Fanning, who should have gotten started just a couple minutes ago. So if you want to tune into that one, it is ready to go. And hope to see you all throughout the weekend. Thank Bye. you, Lincoln. Thank you.